Did you really think you could contain me? You only made me stronger. If you must call me something before I destroy you all, call me Avogadro. The COD Zombies community is known for their passion and emotional turmoil whenever a brand new map makes its way into the game. And while at times there can be a volatile discourse surrounding a map, it's very rare that that animosity rears its ugly head to focus solely on the developers. But that's exactly what happened with Alpha Omega. It was the middle of summer in 2019 when the third DLC installment for Black Ops 4 was finally introduced. And with expectations being so incredibly high, this was definitely an update that Treyarch couldn't afford to miss. And while this ended up being one of the most polarizing maps inside of the Black Ops 4 Zombies offering, this contemptuous reaction from the fans was so narrow and pointed that I don't think Treyarch really ever expected it. But why exactly? Well, it's actually quite a bit more complicated than you may expect. On the surface, Alpha Omega is a map of compromise. It's nothing more than a product of the modern AAA gaming landscape. If you zoom out, the view of extreme budget cuts, tight deadlines, and pushback from the corporate suits had never been clearer before. This, in turn, made the community, developers, and the map itself all the worse for it. But to sit here and to pretend that there are no redeeming qualities at all is simply untrue. While there are some aspects of this map that are undercooked, there is actually quite a bit of depth to Alpha Omega, showing that even under these dire conditions, Treyarch is always pushing for innovation as well as quality. And while the fanbase may not always fully grasp the tumultuous nature of behind-the-scenes game development, I think it's important to at least attempt attempt to step back and soak in as much understanding as possible. But even if our well of empathy may forever run deep, the emotional toll burdened by a community's shoulders can simply be exacerbated if that level of respect from the devs is not reciprocated. And unfortunately, that's where Alpha Omega struggles the most. At this point in the game's life cycle, the Chaos crew was clearly Treyarch's top priority. This was evidenced by the over-the-top set pieces and lavish design language being poured into every Chaos map from their conception. And even though these maps were phenomenal in many respects, they should have not taken the spotlight away from Ether until after that story had concluded. This creative decision by Treyarch clashes with what the Zombies fans truly wanted, which was a resolution to the narrative of Dr. Monty, the Shadow Man, and Primus and Ultimus. Not only did fans have to wait over two years to pick up from where Revelations had left off, there was a nine-month gap from the launch of Black Ops 4 until Alpha Omega's debut. Not to mention it was another reimagining. But even with all of the DLC and live service issues. Does this mean that the map is an objective failure? Were fans justified to feel distrusting towards the developers? These are just a few of the many questions worth exploring as we continue to unravel the mysteries of Black Ops 4 Zombies. I just want to give a quick reminder that this is episode three of an eight part series for the Black Ops 4 Zombies retrospective we're doing here on the channel. So make sure to check the link in the description to view the whole entire playlist. All right, back to the video. Throughout the Black Ops 4 life cycle, Treyarch was revealing DLC content via live stream. This broadcast would contain developer interviews, trailers, and everything that you'd need to know about the upcoming content drop, and DLC 3 was no exception. Everyone eagerly waited while the timer began to count down so that they could see what Treyarch had been cooking. And to everyone's surprise, this new thematic entry into Black Ops 4 was entirely zombies related. This content drop was aptly named Operation Apocalypse Z, and inside of the trailer we saw not only our first glimpse of Alpha Omega, but multiplayer and Blackout were getting a zombies makeover as well. And while most hardcore zombies fans don't always play these other modes, it was clear that this was an olive branch to the entire player base, and one that I would say was well received. But what about the real zombies content? What about Alpha Omega? So remember a few minutes ago when I said that this whole thing was complicated? Well, let's talk about why. While waiting for extended periods of time for new video game content is pretty par for the course these days, players generally will be understanding if the new content is being held back for polish reasons so that it comes out with a bang. So when the swirling rumors of a Nuketown reimagining came true, fans were truly upset that the Ether storyline was getting less than stellar treatment yet again. However, the Zombies dev team likely anticipated our reaction and looking back, I think it's fair to say that they really tried to make the best out of a bad situation. 
elevation. This map is 400% larger than the original map. Four okay. times bigger. Uh, that means there's more places to explore. Of a magnitude of four. There's, there's more space above ground and below ground. What you used to see was a quarter of what's really there now. I'm just approaching statistics in different ways here. Treyarch really wanted us to know that this wasn't a tiny Nuketown remake and that it was a full-fledged map with tons of depth and exploration. Craig Houston, the lead writer, was also emphatic about something never done before in Zombies, bringing two crews into a map, mixing and matching them, allowing for a narrative discourse the likes that we had never seen. So we had Primus and Ultimus face to face. Where are we going to go from there? Well, guess what idiot Craig decided? <laughs> Let's put them all in one map and double the narrative workload. This explanation was paired with Craig stating that Alpha Omega would be exploring unique aspects of the Aether timeline and providing some much needed closure to the loose ends hanging off of this narrative fray. Developers were also excitedly mentioning that there was going to be a boss battle, never before seen Raygun Mark II variants, as well as a brand new perk called Blood Wolf Bite. And when you consider that multiplayer and Blackout both contain Zombies content as well, I think it's fair to say that this offering was fairly substantial on the surface. But when it came to the Zombies dev team, we didn't understand just how underwater they really were. The launch of BO4 Zombies was certainly a bad one, and while Jason Blundell and the rest of the team had plans to make Zombies the biggest and baddest it had ever been, Activision clearly lost faith in that vision and cut their budget incredulously. This means that while maps such as Blood of the the Dead, classified in the entirety of the Chaos storyline, had a full development budget and team, Alpha Omega and the soon-to-be Zombies finale were stretched incredibly thin, and it's why likely we had no true original content for the Aether story. And while we will never know exactly if the reimaginings were planned as the main offering for Black Ops 4, it sure felt like that if things were just reworked and presented a little differently, we could have had the ending that fans truly deserved. Alpha Omega tends to get a bad rap from the community, and one of the things people take issue with is that the map lacks beauty compared to some of the other maps that we have received over time. And while I don't think that it's as gorgeous as a Shadows of Evil or unique as a Dead of the Night, it offers something different with its tone. The color palette of yellowish greens and teal-like blues bring about a sense of bleakness and despair. This is tastefully paired with the map's music, which serves up a lovely dose of 1950s Americana which helps to mask the evil underbelly permeating beneath the surface where ravenous experiments are taking place. Not only is there beauty in the contrast between the polite suburbs above ground clashing with the purpose of Camp Edward, but the friction actually creates a paradox that helps to structure the map's identity. Treyarch really does know how to conceive and construct a tone when it comes to their zombies content, and this is no different, and I would argue it's one of Treyarch's most formidable artistic visions to date. But even though the map has grown into being one of my favorites, even back in 2019, I always felt like there was something slightly off in terms of its core framework. You're not crazy for thinking that if you've ever felt it at some point, but during its development, the main Treyarch team was pulled off of this map as per Activision's request to start production on Black Ops Cold War, while in the meantime, Alpha Omega would be finished up by Activision Shanghai. I assume the same goes for a fair amount of Togdor Toten as well. This this was a gut feeling I could never quite define until after hearing this clip from Chopper's video. While I always felt like there was a sudden shift in the BO4 Zombies life cycle, I could never quite put my finger on it. And between the imposing budget cuts and Sledgehammer and Raven not being able to settle internal disputes, Activision pulled Treyarch from a game mid-development and had an entirely different studio finish it off. And while it feels like Treyarch executed most of their vision for Alpha Omega, it's that last 10 to 15% that brings all things together cohesively that is missing. And this is not a knock at Treyarch by any means. The AAA gaming business is cutthroat, and sacrifices often have to be made, but sometimes it's even at the expense of the fan base, which makes things from our perspective feel truly unjustified. While a little learning may be a dangerous thing, it seems that budget cuts are even more detrimental. The opening cutscene for bringing us back to the Aether storyline was told in a strange cartoonish art style where there are little to no animations other than a warp effect taking place upon the characters' bodies. And while the zombies community seemed to let Derizendrak escape the negative criticism, Alpha Omega was not so easily forgiven. But let's be honest, the art style is pretty damn good, and I actually have no issues with the comic book style cutscene. The issue resides with 
within the priorities of Treyarch and how this game was supposed to solidify a 10 year story arc, but for whatever reason was completely reworked. Nikolai sets us up by explaining how powerful the Cronorium is and how it's taken a drastic effect on Richtofen's life. Not only does Nikolai empathize with Richtofen, but he understands the reasons why Primus and Ultimus have been stuck in the cycle for all of these years and what exactly needs to be done in order to break it. Throughout the cutscene, the visuals are quite profound as they emphasize what has or hasn't occurred since the split from Blood of the Dead. Events such as capturing Richtofen's, Dempsey's, and Takio's soul have all occurred and are trapped inside of the summoning key with the Shadow Man. But Nikolai's soul has not been captured, meaning that the events of both Gorod, Krovi, and Revelations have been altered as well. All of this information takes place in around two minutes, and while it may not be the most cinematic or action-focused cutscene we have ever received, it is most certainly dense with pivotal information that leads us to the moment where we spawn into the map. There is a hollow yet surreal feeling you get when loading into the map for the first time. The claustrophobic spawn area doesn't allow you to get a good view of things initially, but if you walk up to the top of the ramp, you will notice something intensely familiar. Signs posted up state the words Camp Edward, our first indication that we are in the infamous Broken Arrow facility that was introduced into the storyline back in Black Ops 2. However, certain characters that are affiliated with Broken Arrow have been around since World at War and Black Ops 1 Zombies. This made the mystery of who we would stumble into that much more intriguing. This is also one of the biggest maps we've ever done in terms of narrative easter eggs. Let me just say there's a lot of ancillary characters that you have met in the past or if you've not met them you've at least heard about them and mm. they are going to pop up in various ways throughout the map. Broken Arrow, a corrupted American organization, established this encampment in the middle of the Nevada desert with the goals of understanding the zombie outbreak and performing a number of other radical experiments as well. And they were all led by one man, Cornelius Purnell. But due to his power-mad scientific pursuit, something went wrong with the research and the lab is no more. What's interesting about the Broken Arrow narrative is how there are many themes and undertones baked into the overarching premise. For example, the government-funded group attempted to mask the psychopathy they were pursuing by building about the American suburbs so that they would feel at home. This allowed them to bury the troubling nature of the work with what one could call normalcy. And this ideological framework pairs perfectly with the fact that there are these animatronic mannequins that recite lines of cliche American propaganda, pointing out just how empty these slogans mean when taken into the wrong hands. While the Broken Arrow story is certainly compelling, the real reason our characters are there doesn't really have too much to do with that as they are looking for something different, the Elemental Shard. Primus Nikolai seems to be withholding some information regarding the reason behind acquiring the Shard, but it is clearly necessary for our mission in the upcoming DLC 4. But if we look back to the Zombies comic book series, the Elemental Shard was originally set to be picked up by the Victus crew, and the power that the Shard harnesses is insane as it has the ability to bring people back to life, which is something that we'll talk about a little later in this video. Alpha Omega is certainly not a narrative masterpiece, but it is absolutely imperative for the story to move forward. The way Treyarch wove together story bits from Broken Arrow, The Great War, and Primus's journey is very impressive. So impressive that for once, I think it was safe to say the community was left with more answers than actual questions. One of the best aspects of Black Ops 4 Zombies are its main quests. And I know that the community can swing both ways when it comes to this game's easter eggs, but I generally think they house more positives than negatives. And when Alpha Omega launched, I remember this map being quite difficult and having to replay it a handful of times before beating the final boss. But after diving deep into this map over the last few weeks, I have come to find that Alpha Omega is not only much easier than I remember, but also has one of the better main quests and boss fights of Black Black Ops 4. There are certainly some sticking points, primarily the utilization of a central hub for quest progression, but other than that, I find the easter egg to be pretty smooth. Starting things off, we have one of the most fun and engaging moments of turning on the power. Locking us in a room with some of the best music in COD Zombies is much more of a treat than a challenge, and after we get Pack-a-Punch open by removing the sludge from the vents, we are ready to engage with Rushmore for the first time. Rushmore is a supercomputer that was created for the Broken Era 
Cairo facility. And while he is basically just an RTX 4090 with a personality, I'd like to think he is a little bit more than that. What seemingly should be a simple mission for the gang actually becomes problematic when we find out that Rushmore has taken issue with us. He simply just doesn't trust us, so when our characters ask him for the elemental shard, he more or less tells us to fuck off. During this process, he realizes that he has not been activated in over 50 years and that the entire base has been destroyed. Our only way to achieve the elemental shard is through bringing the facility back online and completing a series of challenges. Bringing the facility back online is actually one of the most cleverly crafted quest steps I think Treyarch has ever implemented. It's not really that challenging per se, but it gives the player so many rewards simply by playing the game, which is what you love to see. Once the player purchases the Galvanuckles wall by, we can make our way down to the lower section of Nuketown and melee a zombie in front of a particular television set, where then a series of numbers will be read aloud. It's the player's job to take these codes, correlate them to the respective houses, and then adjust the clocks on the wall of those houses to match the remaining parts of the code. For example, if the code is F0115, then that means we have to head to house F and adjust the clock to you guessed it, 115. While completing this process, the player is rewarded with tons of features that the map does not simply start with. In houses A, B, D, and F, there are new overpowered traps that you are able to use. In house C, there is a free pack-a-punched weapon. And in house E, the player is rewarded with a standard papped ray gun mark II. This is all earned simply by experiencing what the map has to offer, and it's done in a streamlined and dare I say, intuitive manner. And while I think the challenge could be maybe a bit more more, I guess, challenging, I'm never ever going to complain about being rewarded for our efforts while completing Easter egg steps. After this first step is completed, we head back to Rushmore to now begin the next portion of the Easter egg, or as our lovely AI companion calls them, completing Broken Arrow's core values. Broken Arrow core value one, pursue all avenues of science. Our first core value has us seeking out a red crawler somewhere in Camp Edward and escorting him to the transfusion facility. For the most part, this step is pretty simple, but every now and again, it can be a bit finicky as the crawler can spawn in a very random spot in the map that is super out of the way. And if he is accidentally killed, the round will progress, which inevitably makes the zombies more difficult, but such is life. Return to operations and learn Broken Arrow's second core value. I cannot tell a lie. According to Rushmore, there is a second intruder on the map, and they have stolen a canister from the transfusion facility where we had recently dropped off our red Nova crawler. In order to retrieve it, we need to find a way to bully the person as a regular gun will not do justice to retrieve our canister. What's funny about this step is that the person who broke into Camp Edward is none other than Marlton from the Victus crew. Treyarch satisfies some narrative bits here as we finally find Marlton where he was hiding in the bunker from all those years ago in Black Ops 2's Nuketown Zombies. To properly bully Marlton, we need to unlock the ADAM unit as the threat of a lethal AI is the only way to satiate his lack of fear. There are three codes hidden on the map. Once found, we enter them into Rushmore's computer where access to the ADAM unit will be granted. Then we lure the ADAM unit over to Marlton's hiding place where we hear him cower in fear and give us back the stolen goods. An ADAM unit? Okay, okay, checkmate. I'll give you the canister. Just don't let that thing murder me! Which brings us to Broken Arrow Core Value 3. Prevail over the impossible to open new worlds. While Rushmore may simply be a computer, he is a computer with emotional needs, and his need at this point in the Easter egg is to expand his knowledge, but of course, he needs a lending hand. Somewhere on the map is a server that we need to power on and link to Rushmore, and to do that, a jolting jack has to shoot the server in order to provide temporary power. Once we receive aid from our enemies, we need to teleport to operations as quickly as possible to link everything back to the mainframe. Shortly after, Rushmore reveals that Purnell did not want Rushmore to be able to expand his database without human approval and that he needs a special code to bypass the system. There are three of these codes hidden around the map underneath paintings, and by using the Brain Rot ammo mod on our bullet weapons, we can convince the zombies to move the paintings out of the way to reveal the codes. Hmm, I wonder if I can use this technique to make my family help me move. Yeah, we're getting off track. Broken Arrow Core Value 4. Protect the American Dream. 
Now that Rushmore is finally connected to the server, it's time to pursue core value number four. And while our beloved supercomputer is relaying the information to us, the power goes off on the map and we have to turn it back on by flipping a series of switches. I used to think that this step was really annoying as remembering the order of which switches needed to be up versus down always confused me, but it may possibly be the easiest step ever created in Zombies history. The diner beds and generators are all up switches and the solitary storage and lounge are all down switches. And if you just kind of split it up into your mind into two sections, it's really not that complicated, or maybe it never was complicated, and I'm just a moron. Anyways, moving on. And now the fifth and final core value of Project Broken Arrow. Prepare for tomorrow and humanity's future. The final and best core value is just what Rushmore said. Prepare for tomorrow and humanity's future. The player has to locate three glowing ADAM units around the map and complete timed lockdown scenarios where you are bombarded by zombies in a tight quartered space. And it's just a super fun step. Once all three parts are collected, head over to the APD interrogation and place all of the missing parts onto the body inside of the chair. But as usual in COD Zombies, we're not done yet. Rushmore tells us that we have to find a blue glowing orb hidden somewhere on the map and have to escort it back to the mannequin that we just restored. While the player is escorting this orb, zombies are spawning in constantly and going absolutely insane. The step can be pretty challenging if you don't know how to anticipate the zombie spawns or you just don't have a good enough wonder weapon. However, if you use one of the many game-breaking secret codes that you can enter into Rushmore, you can actually activate a five minute long undead man walking feature that brings the zombies to a near dead stop pun intended. This turns what is generally one of the most difficult quest steps in the game to a mindless nothing burger. Do people say nothing burger anymore? Once the player brings the orb back to the ADAM unit, the next bit of the story exposition begins to unfold. Peter McCain makes his final appearance in the COD zombie storyline and what a way to go. The whole point of putting this ADAM unit back together and escorting the orb is to allow Peter to transfer his life essence to a more comfortable comfortable and suitable existence. Up until this point, the community was under the impression that Peter McCain was dead and there was no real reason to expect otherwise. But due to Purnell's deep guilt for losing McCain at the Rising Sun facility, Purnell felt that it was justice to try and bring McCain back to life. So Purnell and Dr. Hale, another Broken Arrow scientist, used the elemental shard to do just that. After the transfer of McCain is complete, Rushmore and good old Pete have a heartfelt conversation, leading us to have earned this glorified talking GPUs trust, and now we can take the elemental shard with us. But we're not stopping there. We do have one more thing. Nikolai and the boys make their way down to the APD, but in order to power it on, they need to collect the souls of the ADAM units. And these particular ADAM units are a little more tanky than your average zombie. Once the APD is filled with souls, Primus and Ultimus attempt to open the structure's door, but Rushmore realizes there is something inhibiting him from gaining full access. And this is when we are introduced to the Avogadro. A quick voice scan determines that our electric brainstem of doom is actually Cornelius Purnell. You see, Purnell had gone mad just like all of those before him who had attempted to study Agartha and the Aether. And just like those same men, Purnell tried to fuse himself with it and was ultimately transformed into this creature. Up until this point, the only boss fight we had experienced in the Aether storyline was during Blood of the Dead. And that fight is quite frankly a joke in terms of difficulty. This encounter with the Avogadro is one of the better fights of Black Ops 4 in general, as it puts your skills to the test in a really interesting way. The fight begins by sequestering each area of the lower section of the map and forcing us to fight the Avogadro and these ADAM units with increased health. And in each area, there are canisters that need to be filled with souls, so you have to engage with these enemies as this is not a time-gated challenge. And if you're not careful, the Avogadro can one-shot you, so it is imperative to bring a perk like Victorious Tortoise or Dying Wish or even Time Slip so you can use your equipment and your specialist more frequently. But once all the soul canisters are filled up in each section, we need to make our way back to the APD and shoot the Avogadro back inside of it. To do this, you can shoot him with any weapon and he will become stunlocked for a moment, and you need to shoot and push him in a certain direction so he will be suctioned up by the APD. 
It isn't too challenging, but it can be tricky with the ADAM unit swatting you from behind. The Avogadro doesn't stay stunlocked for very long either, meaning if you make the tiniest mistake, he can rise up and end your game in an instant. It's a very intense moment of the quest, and I really like how this boss fight ends with it, as it makes the player feel like they beat the map just in the nick of time. But now that the Avogadro has been sucked into the APD, he is sent to the Hanford site, aka Transit. This actually ties up the narrative loose end as to why the Avogadro is in transit, which is a really cool connection to make. And now that he is out of the way, we can grab the elemental shard and watch the cutscene begin to play. Happy, Nikolai? Everything playing out as the Chronorium predicted. We have what we came for. The Elemental Shard. Hooray for us! It's too late! Maxis? What's happening, Nikolai? You are too late. Just like the opening cutscene, this ending is packed with tons of narrative information and continues the theme of bringing those subplots to their conclusions. Dr. Monty has found out what we have done, he knows we have broken the cycle and are on a new path with the Cronorium, and he knows that Nikolai is also our leader. Monty reveals his true form and kills Maxis in cold blood, but not before Maxis can send away Samantha and little Eddie Richtofen. Alpha Omega may not be a cinematic spectacle like other zombies maps, but it really shines bright with its narrative, main quest, boss fight, an extensive cast of characters. It really is just a joy to play through this easter egg over and over again. It's challenging, it's goofy, and it's overall really well designed. But unfortunately, Treyarch wasn't able to see this map all the way through, and that is felt very much so in Alpha Omega's core gameplay design. The gameplay on Alpha Omega has always posed somewhat of a threat to the average Zombies fan, myself included. The claustrophobic layout of the map can be quite off-putting to new players, as figuring out a viable training strategy isn't so obvious from the jump. But once the player begins to understand the fundamental principles of the map, everything starts to click, giving what I would consider an enjoyable experience. But what do I mean by that? Well, the key to success on Alpha Omega is understanding the layout of the map, which doors to open or to keep closed 
how to funnel zombies properly to their demise, and which Raygun Mark II variant pairs with your playstyle. And to be quite honest with you, Alpha Omega gives the player a ton of control when it comes to mixing these points together. So let's talk about it. The first thing to understand is how the map has a lot of symmetry built into its design. This makes learning the map much less daunting than compared to something like Blood of the Dead or even Origins. And this symmetry not only runs from left to right, but from top to bottom, which gives the player a great advantage when navigating, as almost every area in the map has multiple entry or escape points, and as long as you are slippery enough, you're likely to make it through the horde. Another trait of this map I find very compelling is the manipulation of buying doors. Alpha Omega has a lot of paths that don't fully open when you purchase the corresponding door. So if the player is careful, they can open up the map in such a way that allows them to sequester zombies to certain areas. That way they can take advantage of certain spawn points, which can be very helpful in a map this constrictive. After mastering the first two skills, the player can merge their knowledge of the map layout, door buys, and some of the main quest steps to take things to the next level by leading zombies into specific areas to die in mass. While this isn't the only map you can do this kind of strategy with, Alpha Omega is an example of where Treyarch gave the player's control exceedingly well. This type of nuance and creativity behind player choice is exactly what is needed in more zombies maps, and the developers should be commended for their efforts. Before we talk about Wonder Weapons though, we have to address a few elephants in the room. Just like every other zombies map, there are always one or two glaring issues that can ruin the experience for some people. And in the case of Alpha Omega, it's absolutely no different. The first glaring issue is the pack-a-punch system. When you're initially getting set up, opening the vents is a completely fine step to do. But over time, they continue to get clogged up again and they have to be constantly maintained in order to use the pack-a-punch. In theory, I can see this idea being kind of fun, but in practice, it's completely pointless and inhibits the player experience by halting you to a complete stop. And while I know that the vents are a huge sticking point for the community, I personally think that there is something much, much worse on the map that can be summed up with just three little words. Nova 6 Crawlers. These little bastards are quite literally the worst part about Alpha Omega. They completely remove all and any semblance of game flow by injecting constant interruptions that in my opinion greatly impact the player experience. There are two kinds of these enemies in Alpha Omega and they're both new variations. First we have the Jolting Jack that has the ability to shoot lightning at the player from any distance and height. Then we also have the Nova Bomber which crawls around and squirts a yellow substance onto zombies, increasing their speed and health. Now it's not uncommon for a non-traditional enemy to break up the gameplay pace, but usually when this happens there is some sort of give and take to bring about balance. Inside of Blood of the Dead, Brutus will perform a slam attack that will mess up the train, hurt the player while covering them in electricity. But in order to combat that, the zombies are actually knocked down if they are in the vicinity of that slam. It's a fair trade-off so that if the player gets hurt by this attack, they have a chance to escape while they are physically and visually impaired. The issue with these new Nova 6 crawlers is that they have no real counterattacks at all. All they do is provide buffs for the zombies and debuffs for the player. It's genuinely bad game design. With the Jolting Jacks, the player can be training in any location above ground and will get blasted constantly with attacks occurring from all different directions. Most of the time you will notice they are sitting above you perched on the top of a roof, chipping away at your health bar with pinpoint precision. However, they can also fucking teleport, which means after a few moments of getting shot from above, the jacks will fly down and shoot you from the ground while also interrupting your train by standing in your way. But don't get it twisted, the Nova 6 bombers are much, much worse. There is a misconception that if you just stay above ground, you can avoid the bombers as they only spawn in the map if you go down to the lower level. But that is a huge problem in my eyes because that means essentially a whole level of the map is unplayable. And if we're being completely fucking honest, they're not even fully unavoidable even if you stick to the top level of the map only. If the player just ever so slightly comes within the vicinity of one of these entrances to the lower level, these assholes will spawn in and then you'll be dealing with both kinds of enemy types above Above ground. These enemies take what could be considered one of the more creative gameplay maps in Black Ops 4 and bring it down to just mediocrity simply because there is no true counter other than to just avoid certain areas of the map. I can hear arguments of people saying that there is no difference between opening certain doors versus not going to the lower level to avoid bombers, and there is some truth to that. But the main separation between these ideologies is that one promotes player choice through creativity, while the other promotes creativity by removing player choice, and to me, that difference is staggering.
The more I play COD Zombies, the more I realize just how damn special the Ray Gun Mark II is. Whether you're using it on Buried or a Zombies Chronicles map or Alpha Omega, it has such an iconic place in our community's history. And this is why I think it was such a great move to not only bring it back for Black Ops 4, but to bring in four elemental variants on top of the original. You'll find that there's been some secret weapons research going on. And these weapons are prototype Ray Guns that were developed at Broken Arrow. I won't lie to you guys. I remember watching this stream live in 2019 and I was very burnt out on the developers and how they had mistreated the Ether storyline. And then when I saw they were bringing back the Mark II for Alpha Omega, I was pretty heated. But looking back, I couldn't have been more wrong as all of these Wonder Weapon variants are absolutely stellar and they help to create such a variety of fun gameplay moments. Building and acquiring these ray guns is definitely one of the highlights to Alpha Omega as they require you to use features in and outside of the map in such a way that make you feel smart for doing it, but they're not tedious to the point where crafting them is an absolute drag. After the player fills up four soul boxes around the map, they will receive a code that they can input into Rushmore. This will give them access to a secret compartment holding four Ray Gun Mark II frames, which need to be built using canisters that are hidden around Camp Edward. To find these canisters, the player needs to shoot certain objects around the map that correlate to specific ammo types from the Pack-a-Punch. This will then reveal a canister that needs to be recharged. The electric variant has you shooting the tops of utility poles, the brain rot variant requires the use of the teleporter pads, the fire variant requires use of the wraith fires and the chimneys, and the ice variant requires us to freeze zombies and melee them. After all the respective steps are complete, you place the canisters in a specific location pertaining to that element, fill it up with the zombie souls, and craft it on the workbench above Rushmore. It's literally that simple, and you can swap out each variant whenever you want, meaning you don't have to stick with just one ray gun. They're also pretty damn balanced, meaning that there isn't one that shines above the rest, and they're all useful depending on the situation. The Mark IIV has an electric capability which gives the player unlimited ammo, but after the magazine empties there is a cooldown period before the max capacity is reached. The Mark II X is a dual wield Mark II that is fully auto and this thing runs out of ammo so damn fast you won't even be able to say, Hi guys, Mr. Offwaffles here. The Mark II Y is an explosive ray gun and to help combat being immensely overpowered, you're fairly limited with your ammo reserve. And the Mark II Z is a full auto shotgun and this one doesn't have that many drawbacks except for maybe range. But at at the end of the day, they are all fantastic wonder weapons. They all have a different set of positives and negatives depending on what your goal is for that particular game. Being able to swap between them freely gives the player ultimate control when it comes to having the most curated experience possible, especially when going for high rounds. When it comes to completing a round 100 on this map, it really seems like the Mark IIY is the best for large crowd control, but you can really make a case for using any of the wonder weapons just depending on your early game strategy. But for the most part, the explosive damage from the Y is going to get you the farthest. But generally speaking, getting to high rounds on this map is actually quite fun. Like I mentioned previously, there are many avenues of customization on Alpha Omega. All you have to do is simply not open up the map to its fullest extent. By doing this, the player is able to force zombies to only spawn from particular areas and can create custom training zones to maximize speed and efficiency. Eventually, you'll reach a point where it becomes overbearing and you'll have to resort to using traps, but there are a ton of different options. The best strategy that I have found is a mix of training up until about round 50, then using a mix of traps and wraith fires to push through those 60s, 70s, and 80s. By keeping the left side of the map closed between spawn, APD interrogation, and the transfusion facility, you can create a prime area for training and manage it safely up to the 40s or 50s, and even higher if you're a super skilled player. For a majority of this section, you can use any Mark II variant you want, but I really do recommend the Y if you can be spared with the ammo. However, once you get to the mid 40s or 50s, you're gonna want to head to house B and use the fan blade trap to kill zombies. And while you're in between trap resets, train the zombies around the map and kill them with your wraith fires. This strategy isn't terribly slow or terribly fast. It sits about right in the middle. And I bet you could get to around 100 in about eight to 10 hours, which is most certainly a long time, but since the strat is fun to do, it doesn't make getting up there feel mindless like some of the other strategies for this map. While Alpha Omega can be somewhat of a challenging map due to the tight spaces and Nova 6 crawlers, it's also a very dense map that's packed with content which is all very accessible and super fun to do, especially the side quests. 
While there are some rewards to be had, there is nothing immensely superior from a gameplay POV. There is no ice shield or super duper melee weapon, the content is simply fun. That's it. Knifing or shooting the heads off of every mannequin in the map will reward the player with either an extra life or a free perk, and the way Treyarch packaged these experiences is phenomenal. For the free extra life, there are mannequins that play a form of red light green light but will stop when the player looks at them. The extra perk bottle the player receives falls from the sky like a bomb pummeling its way to the earth. And the best part is, if you want to troll your friends, you can have them melee every mannequin on the map with the Galva Knuckles, and Treyarch will put a jump scare next to the Pack-a-Punch. And there's even more trolling on this map, with a second jump scare behind the greenhouse, and a side easter egg with Ted who will kill the player if they knife him too many times. Absolutely brilliant stuff. There is also an easter egg song, an 80am unit you can unlock to help kill zombies alongside you, and even tons of codes that you can punch into Rushmore, reward rewarding you with power-ups and even crazy shit like this. And while all these side quests are amazing, I think the best one would have to be Insanity Mode, which instantly puts the player onto round 200. By waiting until the Nuketown clock reads 1 and the population side reads 15, look over in the shed behind the yellow house and you will notice a pink orb. After interacting with the orb, an escort mission will begin where you have to lead it all the way to the APD interrogation room. The orb will then ingest itself inside of a computer and the player will need to break glass in case of an emergency, which apparently this is for whatever reason. After the glass has been broken, a code will pop out that needs to be entered into Rushmore. After the current round is completed, a menacing announcer voice will let the player know that shit is about to go down. Not only does this easter egg transport you to round 200 instantly, it locks the map to the original Nuketown Zombies format. There is no downstairs section and there is no ability to go to the spawn area to spread out the zombies train. And while I love the type of side quest that gives the player a new secret weapon or tons of extra perks, I think there is something to be said about side quests that simply provide the value of fun. Because what the hell is the point of playing video games at all if at the core of them they aren't enjoyable? I have said it before and I will say it again, Rush just is not a very fun side mode. It's okay for mindlessly grinding weapon camos and maybe messing around with friends, but it really just adds no value to the COD Zombies experience. I have been playing it a lot for every single BO4 retrospective, and on every single map it's the same strategy of protecting yourself with a shield and trying your best not to ever get hit. You can't fully pack a punch any weapons and you have to wait until the game decides you can access the map fully. I I just don't get it, and I don't think Alpha Omega is an exception to this at all. But lord help me, Alpha Omega's gauntlet was tough as hell. I will say that looking back on it after recently completing it for the first time in years, it is much more tedious than I remember it being. If you see the rules here up on screen, you'll notice that there are a lot of challenges that require you to melee or simply meleeing is your best bet since you have to do some otherwise weird shit that makes firing your weapon a lot more difficult. There is one challenge that allows you to kill zombies while you're prone, but if the zombies walk on you, your character model will automatically stand up, making the challenge very finicky. There are also a few of the kill zombies with an unpacked weapon challenge, and goddamn, these are absolutely brutal. On round 26, Treyarch expects you to kill zombies with an unpacked LMG, and the problem is, there is only one LMG wall buy on the map, and guess what? It's in the basement. And who spawns in the basement, you may ask? The fucking Nova 6 bombers. But then on the other hand, there are some really fun and well thought out challenges. There is one where the player has to run towards nuke power-ups falling from the the sky and use them to complete the round without killing a zombie with their gun. There is also another challenge where you have to use the ADAM unit and can only kill zombies when you're in his proximity. This is a very clever challenge as you now have to be constantly aware of where he may move while also anticipating zombies trying to rip your face off. The final challenge has you survive an onslaught of evil ADAM units and the Avogadro, which is a nice change of pace from the regular boss fight from the main easter egg quest. When I look back on completing this gauntlet, 
it, my initial thought is that I had a good time and it is a solid experience. It's definitely not the best one, but it certainly provides a level of challenge and out of the box thinking that none of the other gauntlets have provided thus far. The experience that Alpha Omega offers today versus the one it offered in 2019 is absolutely identical. The only difference between the two is community perception, and it's clear that this map got a bad rap for all the wrong reasons. The community wanted original maps and locations, original wonder weapons and bosses, and a season full of twists and turns that we would never forget. And when you strip away all of the baggage, you can see that there is a beautiful top tier map underneath it all. This is a map that the devs clearly cared about. A map that was was packed with side content, five different wonder weapon variants, an amazing easter egg quest, and tons of gameplay variety. But the simple truth is, even though this is a great map, I still can't help thinking about what could have been, and that makes things bittersweet when it comes to Alpha Omega. There is always going to be a ton that the community will never know or understand when it comes to game development, and unfortunately, the Zombies team lost a lot of their resources that year due to Blackout success, BO4 Zombies rough launch, and to the development of Black Ops Cold War for 2020. While there is always a game of tug of war being played behind the scenes between the developers and the higher ups, it doesn't change the outcome of what actually happens in the game or make it any easier for people to deal with. So yeah, maybe fans may have been too quick to hate on Alpha Omega and maybe they overlooked some of the brilliance that shines beneath the surface. But I do think that fans were right to take a step back and finally realize that Treyarch are imperfect and they can in fact make mistakes. Mistakes. Thank you so much for watching another Black Ops 4 Zombies retrospective. I'll see you in Tagged or Toten.